Hello, everyone. I am here to welcome you to today's Write Virtual Visits. We're really glad to have you joining us live on Facebook. For those who don't know me, my name is Eric Rogers, and I'm the manager of events and communications at the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy. I'm coming to you from our offices in Chicago. Um, I want to thank all of the people that make Write Virtual Visits possible every month. Um, my co-conspirator in planning this series this year has been Anna Kaplan, the executive director of Greycliff in Derby, New York. Uh, we also have working behind the scenes today a, uh, a special guest who many of you know, Heidi Ruley, is helping out monitoring the Facebook comments. Um, do want to, of course, remind you that you can put questions or comments in on Facebook at any time, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Um, I, of course, also want to extend our deepest gratitude to Forever Ready Productions, who have been doing a fantastic job of producing these live streaming events over the past year. Um, and they have a short video that they'd like to share highlighting their work. You know that feeling you get when something inspires you? The kind of feeling that inspires you to act? That's where we come in. We tell mission-focused stories tailored to your goals. Our collaborative, efficient, and service-oriented creativity simplifies all your video needs. Relationships, not clients. Stories, not content. Forever Ready Productions. Well, thanks again to the whole team at Forever Ready, especially Allison Wong, who is producing today's episode. We've worked with them a lot over the last three, almost four years now, uh, and can't recommend them enough. So now I'd like to uh, turn our attention to today's program. And this is a particularly exciting right virtual visit because for the first time in a while, we're featuring a brand new site. Um, at the Conservancy's annual conference about a month ago in Minneapolis, we had the opportunity to meet and get to know Jack Coffey, who was attending on behalf of Florida Southern College. Florida Southern has an amazing campus that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright that we have not yet had the opportunity to explore in Wright virtual visits. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jack and bring Florida Southern into this program. Hi, Jack. How are you? Hi, doing well. Thank you. How about yourself? Doing great. Excited to see what you have to share with us today. Um, I think uh, I'm ready to turn it over to you. I know you've got some exciting uh, things to to show. All right, thank you. Uh, well, hi everyone. Again, my name is Jack. I'm the uh, manager of tours and educational programs here at Florida Southern, and uh, I'm here to showcase our Annie Pfeiffer Chapel today. Now, uh, for some of you are likely very familiar with our campus, or maybe a bit familiar, but a lot of you may not even realize that Wright did any work in the state of Florida. Well, the campus here is a fantastic part of his career, one of the single largest and most important commissions in his entire career. Uh, a brief history, just a summary of how this all came to be. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, reached out to by a telegram in 1938 by the president of Florida Southern at the time, a guy by the name of Dr. Lud Spivey. Dr. Spivey was a uh, was reaching out to Wright for a meeting to discuss a full campus redesign, uh, what Spivey called a quote-unquote great education temple in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, 
what's interesting, though, is that Dr. Spivey was not reaching out to Florida Southern because the college was in, you know, a state of prosperity and they were looking to bring in an internationally known architect to herald their success. Rather, uh, this was a bit of a desperate gamble on Spivey's end. Florida Southern, like so many other small private colleges of its time period, was uh, really struggling financially because of the Great Depression. And Spivey, for the past five, six years, was really the only reason that Florida Southern had continued to exist as an institution. I mean, within the first year of the Great Depression alone, Florida Southern lost 90% of its enrollment, just dropping out because no one could afford college education anymore. But Spivey was a man of ambition and vision, and he foresaw that if he could get Frank Lloyd Wright down here to redesign the entire campus, Wright would uh, essentially put this place back on the map in a big, big way. Uh, hopefully re-cement it back into the fabric of higher ed for the state of Florida and ensure the college's long-term success. Wright was luckily very amenable to the idea. He signed on after just a single in-person meeting with Spivey, as well as a single visit to see the campus grounds and see what he would be working with. It would produce the longest lasting commission of Wright's entire career. Uh, 20 years working on this project. He worked on it from 38 to 58, pretty much the last 20 years of his career and the last 20 years of his life. During that time, he produced 18 designs of which 13 were built. And we're gonna take a look at today, the first building produced of that partnership, the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel. So if you don't mind, I'm going to flip my camera around and we'll go ahead and take a look at the space. Now, the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel was again designed 1938 built 38 to 41. It is one of just uh, 10 uh, religious designs by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's our oldest campus building. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright had a fantastic quote when talking about the campus as a whole. He said that he wanted the buildings here to come out of the ground and into the light. And I think you'll see once I come out from underneath the mezzanine level here, just exactly how he applied that to the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel. If you were to see the outside of this building, you'd find it has a tower on the roof, one of a few bell towers of Wright's design for churches, just a few, he normally didn't go for them. And the whole ceiling in the space to look straight up through that signature tower up on the roof. Now the metalwork up there was actually meant to be covered in vines, these bow tie shapes you can see to the left and right now, uh, six in total cleverly disguised flower boxes. Wright wanted all of that metalwork out there to be covered with flowering bougainvillea vines. So you'd be looking up at the natural sky through uh, flowering vines. Unfortunately though, Wright did, uh, this was his first time ever working in the state of Florida, a humid subtropical climate, you know. He did underestimate the power of Florida sun. It heated the metal to the point where vines just would not take. Something our restoration team wants to address in the near future is maybe getting vines growing across. Now from here, I can turn around and showcase the other areas of the building. The building is almost totally hollow in its overall uh, design and was designed to seat approximately 800 persons, which it does not feel that large, but it can technically seat that amount. The um, use of the mezzanine level as well as Wright's meeting house style inward facing seating gives it a lot of intimacy. Now, if you look, you can see a column straight ahead if you look closely. There are actually four columns in this building, one next to each of the four doorways, kind of at the four corners of the building. These columns are all that support everything that's above us, the roof and the tower, which the tower is 65 feet tall, by the way, from its ground floor level. It's, this is one of the few buildings in Wright's career that's truly vertical in effect. The whole tower and ceiling, the mezzanine level, is uh, completely cantilevered out from just those four pillars. It becomes even more impressive when I note that this building was built by college students 
working for scholarships. That was Frank Lloyd Wright's idea, but luckily Dr. Spivey was a huge fan of experiential learning and Florida Southern did have a trades program as well. So um, students signed up, it was the depression after all, students signed up in droves to work on the building, so much so that this building was just built entirely by students working for scholarships back during the Great Depression. Now, you'll notice the sanctuary here is a little bit missing a uh, little bit, you know, seemingly incomplete. That's because it is missing Wright's pulpit, which is meant to sit where the podium is. Restoring that pulpit, as in rebuilding it completely, is another goal of our restoration efforts. But these are beautiful 2015 reconstructions of Wright's original church pews. The uh, originals were replaced with some that weren't very Wrightian in look in uh, the 1970s when the originals were too worn down from decades of student use. So these are beautiful 2015 reconstructions of Wright's original design. Now, I'm going to turn attention to the walls here. The, our buildings on the campus are built out textile blocks. If you're familiar with Wright buildings like the Ennis House, the uh, La Miniature, the Millard House, uh, and the like, uh, some of the Usonian automatics like the Khalil House, it's the same construction system. Wright's knitted and weaved concrete blocks uh, you'll notice these blocks are very tan compared to your typical textile blocks. That's because Wright filled them with a tan beach sand from Florida's Atlantic coast, giving, giving them a very warm and distinctly Floridian feel. Now, if I turn the light off here, you'll be able to see just another feature that's extraordinarily special about our textile blocks. These blocks are filled with pieces of colored glass. Wright would do this a lot with his textile block buildings. He'd fill the blocks with pieces of glass, but in all of his other block projects, he'd fill holes like this with clear glass. The use of colored glass is totally unique to our campus. You'll find it in no other textile block work in Wright's entire career. And you can just see it's a beautiful effect. This building has more colored glass pieces in its blocks than all of the rest of the campus combined. Across all the textile blocks in this building, there are over 50,000 handcrafted, hand inserted pieces of colored glass. Uh, so all of these were just put in by hand, one at a time by the students who built the building. Uh, if you're wondering about a color scheme, Wright stipulated that he wanted as many colors as possible and that he wanted absolute randomness as to what colors went where. He did not want there to be any discernible pattern, which is quite surprising for Frank Lloyd Wright, if I'm being honest. Now I'm gonna take a trip upstairs here to talk about the mezzanine level, but you'll notice we do have Frank Lloyd Wright's signature levitating stairwells, where he has these bars in place of regular handrails. You also see that he fills the stairs themselves with textile blocks with the glass pieces coming in. It's a beautiful, beautiful effect. And I think you'll find that once we do head upstairs, it's a totally different feel compared to downstairs. It's just a magnificent view. Upstairs, I'll note, is not normally a place that we go on our guided tours. So this is a bit of a unique view to see. But if you look at the height of this guard wall, it's not even knee height. You'll know why we don't take our guided tours up here. Now, uh, again, you can see for sure just how interesting the view is up here. Now, this space back here that you may have noticed with all of these intricate concrete patterns is the choir loft. This ornate concrete wall is our choir screen. Now, uh, Frank, this goes back actually to Gothic cathedral design. A lot of cathedrals will have a mezzanine like this, a loft for their choirs to perform in with a perforated masonry wall, a screen in front, uh, or a perforated wood wall as well. It's the whole idea that the choir should be heard but not seen. You should focus on their song, their message, as opposed to uh, who physically is singing. Your focus should be on the religious experience. You can also see the organ back there hiding behind these shapes. Uh, it was meant to be an organ loft as well, but uh, 
and that organ is original to the building, hand selected by Wright from an organ vendor, I believe in Ohio. Much to Dr. Spivey's dismay, the organ cost three times more to purchase and ship than Wright said it would. Now, as for the individual shapes that make up the choir screen itself, we know for a fact that these actually do have some kind of abstract meaning. Wright wants them to represent something, but uh, he took that meaning to his grave. We don't know what these shapes represent. You'll often see a lot of the lit literature on the campus refer to them as golden eagles, birds in nosedive with tail feathers at the top, followed by a wingspan and then a head down below are one of the most common overarching interpretations of this shape. But uh, again, that's far from a consensus. Uh, there's so many different theories as to what this shape could represent. I call it the single biggest mystery still left on the right campus. Now, uh, I'm just going to pull us over here for another beautiful view where you can look straight up here and see the other side of those concrete shapes that, again, hide those flower boxes. The, uh, these are actually what is what are structural for the tower on the roof it's basically they're basically concealing steel x-shaped beams that go straight up again three on each side it's a gorgeous effect to be able to stand here and just see straight up to those very unique geometric shapes often compared again to bow ties uh TIE Fighters from Star Wars, Wrapped Candies, Origami. Wright and his plans actually labeled them lanterns, which is very abstract, but basically the center shape that's a hexagon, if you were to look at it from outside, is the lantern itself. And then you have two pyramid-shaped rays of light shining outward on either side. If you're wondering about the curtains back behind the choir loft, uh, that is currently an area of active restoration given that we are trying to get a new roof on this building. And this building, like so many other Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, does leak. In fact, some might say it's not a true Wright building unless it leaks. So, uh, the, um, so that's what the curtains are doing. It's, you know, pardon our dust, basically. Now, uh, the mezzanine level does ensure that this building reaches the intended 800-person seating capacity while also ensuring that no seat is any further than 50 feet away from where the pulpit is supposed to sit right there. Uh, so that's what gives this building its kind of unexpected intimacy given its overall size. Now I'm gonna pull us up here for just a moment because you can see these, this kind of bay of accordion windows up here. There's one on each side, one looking out from here and the other one to the south. These are meant to be left open to allow air to ventilate. Wright actually had a very ambitious ventilation plan that I'm not going to quite get into uh, for just this brief presentation. But if you look out, you can actually see a few more of our Wright structures. You can see looking out there, uh, our water dome fountain. You can see the Campus Esplanade, the covered walkway system leading over to the original Wright Design Campus Library. There's three little classroom buildings up there. If we come over this way, you can again see that walkway leading more off into the distance over there, which I'll talk about that more in a minute. But first, I'm going to head back downstairs. Uh, in case you're wondering about acoustics, they are magnificent in the building. The default resting acoustics is already uh, quite substantial, but the uh, uh, sanctuary here is amplified so that 
whoever's standing and preaching from here, specifically where the podium is, can be heard by all with very little elevation of their voice. Uh, no matter what row they're sitting in, either floor, the choir loft up there is uh, so amplified that if you have a pair of people just having a casual conversation up there, it can be hard for people on the ground floor to actually speak over them. Meanwhile, the back rows in the back here are actually muffled. Once you step underneath the mezzanine level, there's a muffling that occurs because chattier people are gonna to tend to sit in the back rows. So uh, the minister and the choir are gonna drown them out. And hopefully, uh, you know, they won't disturb chapel services so much. It's a fun effect to showcase on our tours. Uh, with that, I think, uh, I do have some photos to showcase of the other Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. So here's the master plan. This isn't just an assemblage of different commissioned buildings. Uh, the Wright did design a campus master plan, which is pretty unique for him. The, uh, it's the only master, uh, it's the largest number of his buildings built according to a master plan in his entire career. So uh, give me just a sec, I'm switching back to my camera. So you can see kind of how he laid out everything. If you notice the foliage, the foliage it were orange trees. The campus was originally situated in Orange Grove. It's also a hillside site bordering one of Lakeland's over 30 named natural lakes. So he's taking with organic architecture, all of that into account with his master plan. Uh, all right, so uh, next slide, you'll be able to see the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel's exterior. A lot of people comment that the exterior is a little plain compared to the interior design. It can often be deceptive to, you know, you're often expecting a far more architecturally simple space compared to the exterior. A lot of people also feel that from this angle, it looks like a ship with the mast at the top, the wings of the bridge on either side, and then the front prow there. Uh, again, it's the tallest building on the campus at 65 feet from its ground floor level. Uh, so with uh, with the next slide, we can look at the Esplanade again. The Esplanade is the longest covered walkway system of Frank Lloyd Wright's design in his whole career. Uh, it stretches for over a mile in length, and it doesn't just connect to the buildings themselves. It often integrates directly into their facades. Wright wanted the buildings on the campus to feel as though they were parts of a whole rather than truly individual entities. And so the Esplanade columns just integrate directly into the landscape as a result, or directly into the facades of the buildings and tie the campus to the landscape. Uh, with the next slide, we'll be able to see just exactly one instance of how the Esplanade works its way in. These are the three seminar buildings. The three seminars are three small kind of classroom buildings. If you wanna know about Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, Wright's ability to uh, design buildings that were inexpensive, the college asked for quick and cheap to build kind of emergency classroom buildings. Those are 1200 square feet each and cost the college just $7,000 each to build. So uh, they add three new classrooms and six new faculty offices to the campus. Uh, built 1941 to 42, again, entirely by students. Um, next slide here, we'll be able to see the original campus library of rights design, the E. T. Rue Library, which is uh, an interesting building. It's Wright's only freestanding library building ever built. It's also his very first circular building uh, in his career, his first ever full circle. Uh, it's also a... Uh, uh, it's also the only building on campus built during World War II, meaning that it is, uh, was built entirely by women. It's the only building on the whole campus to be built entirely by women. Uh, again, though, female students who are actually working for scholarships rather than, uh, rather than uh, female construction workers coming into the campus during wartime. It's not used as a library anymore though. It was outgrown in terms of book capacity needs and it was converted into another admin office building in the 1960s. 
uh, restoring it is an inevitable goal of our restoration team and our restoration plan. Uh, with the next slide, we can see the uh, administration buildings. Uh, this is one facade of one of our two administration buildings. We have two admin buildings that were designed and built together, 1946 to 48. Uh, while today they house only a small portion of the college's administrative bureaucracy, Wright designed these two buildings to house all of the college's admin offices back in the late 40s. Uh, here, this facade uh, is kind of a, a little portico that leads into the president's office itself, the office space that Wright designed for Dr. Spivey, uh, which that office, I can't show you any good photos of it, unfortunately, but it's very similar to how Wright would normally design the gathering space or great room of a Usonian house, actually, complete with the French door windows. You can see once again, though, how Wright is integrating the esplanade columns into the building's design itself. Uh, next up is the Water Dome, which is also 1948. It's Wright's largest water feature. The pool uh, is 160 feet across. You can see these jets, and that's what they run at on a daily basis. It, they project arches into the center of the pool. However, if they're turned up to full power, they will create a full dome of water rising up 45 feet in the air. Uh, those jets were actually only added in 2007, though. It was the first major action of our campus restoration program. When the pool itself was first cast in 1948, Wright discovered that the technology just didn't exist yet to generate the water pressure needed to create a full dome of water like he wanted. So uh, he just left it incomplete as a circular reflecting pool. And again, it took till 2007 to finally get it up and running. We don't run it any higher than 30% most days, though, because it generates an obscene amount of mist that's very unhealthy for rights surrounding buildings when run at full height. Uh, with the next slide, we have the Industrial Arts Building, which is built 50 to 52. This is a 34,000 square foot classroom building. It was actually a workshop building for the college's trades program. Uh, however, the college lost its trades program year 1970. And since then, it's been used as a much more traditional classroom building for uh, uh, history, political science, and social science lectures. Uh, it does contain Wright's only theater in the round design or Greek theater design as well, which is easily the most interesting classroom of his design on the whole campus. Uh, it's uh, it, the acoustics in that space are some of the weirdest and wackiest acoustics that Wright ever designed uh, for his whole career. It's really wild. Uh, after this, we have the Danforth Chapel. We have two Wright design chapels, uh, a smaller uh, wedding chapel, uh, which was built 54 to 55. The, um, the Danforth Chapel was Wright's uh, second to last building of the original 12 to be completed, you know, second to last during his lifetime, it contains his last ever stained glass uh, windows in his whole career, as well as what is quite possibly his single largest stained glass facade in his whole career. Uh, so it's, uh, Wright was of course known for stained glass, but he largely dropped it after the 1920s. Uh, these are also his first art glass windows for any building in about 30 years, you know, when, in terms of he still designed the occasional art glass, uh, you know, light fixture or and things like that. But these are genuine right designed art glass windows. Uh, you'll notice in this photo, the pulpits and the pews are all original as well. Uh, those are the original right designed furnishings in there. Uh, and then last, the last of the original 12 was the Polk County Science Building, which is on the next slide, built 54 to 58. It's the largest building of Wright's design on the whole campus uh, at 50,000 usable square feet. It is a very rare instance of him making use of aluminum in his career, uh, as well as uh, it's, again, aluminum is not a common material for him to use, but you can see even in this photo, all of the... Uh, in this photo, all of the aluminum uh, covering the, uh, or all of the aluminum elements that he designed into the building, 
uh, again, 50,000 square feet. Uh, the largest building of his design. It also contains one of just two right design greenhouses and his only planetarium building in his whole career. Uh, his only planetarium, which you can see that is in the dome at the far end. We're currently getting ready to begin a full restoration of the interior of the planetarium. And uh, lastly, the last building of the uh, that was built during his lifetime was the use or not built during his lifetime, but our most recent building is our Usonian faculty house. This was part of a neighborhood of homes for professors that Dr. Spivey wanted to build all 20 homes, all designed by Wright. He could never gain funding for it back in the day, but we were able to get the first, uh, the plans for the first house of Wright's design, the only home he designed for that neighborhood. It was built as part of the, our visitor center in 2013. Uh, it's a 1300 square foot prototypical Usonian design, but you can see he still makes use of the textile blocks. Uh, uh, found throughout the campus with the pieces of colored glass, which make it unique amongst Usonian houses. Uh, I was informed that uh, I might be might have been covering the microphone with my finger, and I do apologize there. Just a quick little bit about the Danforth Chapel again. It was Wright's uh, kind of wedding chapel, largest uh, concentration of his, or last stained glass windows of his design in his whole career. Uh, and one of his, quite possibly his largest stained glass facade in his whole career as well. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we're wrapped up. There's our information. We give guided tours seven days a week. So if you want to come and see the campus for yourself, uh, we're open again seven days a week. We're only closed for three major holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Day. Uh, there's our phone number, our website, and uh, our email if you want to get more information. And then if you have any questions that don't quite get answered here at the end, feel free to email me there as well. And uh, hopefully, we'll do we still have time for questions? We've got time for a couple, Jack, and thank yeah. you so much. This was really spectacular um, to see the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel in such detail and then just get a sense of how many right buildings there are on the Florida Southern campus. I mean, what an incredible place that must be to, to spend the day. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, a question I had was, who, who was Annie Pfeiffer? Who is the chapel named after? A uh, single largest financial contributor. All of our buildings are named after their single largest financial contributors, which is in line with uh, the, the campus, uh, with college campuses as a whole. Annie Pfeiffer was, uh, her husband owned a pharmaceutical company out of New York City, and she gave very generously to causes pertaining to Methodist education. Florida Southern is a Methodist affiliated school, uh, founded by and still affiliated with to this day. Uh, now, the... Um, so she donated a third of this building's price tag, which was uh, about $50,000. So of course she gets her name on the building. Um, uh, by the way, if you caught that, this building cost $147,000 when all was said and done, which is about five times more than what Wright budgeted it for. So uh, <laughs> if you caught that we had 18 buildings designed by Wright and 13 have been built. That's the reason why Dr. Spivey couldn't get six built during uh, his te lengthy tenure as president. Wright's buildings usually went pretty far over budget. Only the Danforth Chapel actually came in at budget. All the rest went usually some substantial amount over. And what was the reaction to the introduction of Wright's architecture on the campus? Because um, obviously the college existed before Wright's involvement and Spivey's goal was to put the campus on the map. Was it warmly received at the beginning? Uh, well, when, it, when Wright was commissioned, Florida Southern was sitting at 250 students, which is very meager. The operating budget was about 125000 a year, which even in 30s money is absolutely pitiful to run an entire college by even in, by their standards back then, with money being worth so much more than it is now. By the time Spivey retired in 1957, after 32 years as president, Florida Southern was at 1,500 students. The operating budget was at over $3 million a year in 50s money. 
uh, the number of faculty on payroll had tripled. When Wright presented his master plan, October 1938, Spivey, of course, held a press conference. Uh, what he wasn't, ex he was expecting to get in the local papers was what he wasn't expecting is that his little college was in the front section of the New York Times that mm -hmm. Sunday. So uh, in terms of getting publicity, it worked exactly as he intended. The reception to this building in particular, though, was mostly positive. Not to say that most people, you know, declared a masterpiece. Spivey himself said it was the most beautiful building he had ever seen when it was finished. Uh, but uh, there was a very firm minority of people who, for lack of a better term, were weirded out. This was one of Wright's first built works in the entire deep south, you know, the American southeast. Uh, so there were many people who, and I occasionally get people to this day on our tours who, again, for lack of a better term, are just bamboozled by the building. They, it just looks like it dropped down from Mars. Uh, so again, it's, it wasn't necessarily an overtly negative reaction. It was mostly positive, but there were a substantial number of people who, again, just couldn't wrap their heads around the building. It was just too different from what they expected a building, much less a church to look like. So I think to close us out, we've got one, one more question that uh, points to potentially an interesting story from somebody who clearly knows something. Is Dexter the cat still ruling the campus? <laughs> yeah, Dexter is still around. Dexter uh, is a uh, is a uh, uh, chunky old tabby cat. Uh, he's 17 years old. He's his own cat. He lives on the campus grounds. Uh, he's our tour mascot, and he's easily the most beloved thing on the whole campus. There was a uh, when classes resumed this past semester from uh, the you know summer break. There was a legitimate line of maybe about 30 to 40 students all lined up in class change to say hi to Dexter. So, uh, like I said, I call him our tour mascot. He hangs out specifically around Wright's buildings. And if you're ever visiting our campus, you can just walk right up and pet him. He's not gonna come to you because he's 17 years old. He's not that energetic, but he is the friendliest cat you'll ever meet. I mean, you no introductions needed. He will just accept love and affection from everyone. Well, it sounds like we all need to uh, plan our visits to get the full <laughs> tour and meet Dexter. Um, it's going to be a blast. Thank you so much, Jack. This has been delightful. Yeah. And I hope we can do it again sometime, perhaps, and showcase a different building. Um, yeah. Get information back up there for anybody that is planning their own travel down to Lakeland. Um, seven days a week. That's incredible. That's quite a tour operation. And you're there how many of those days? Six and I'm a half? There, uh, five days a week. Uh, <laughs> sometimes more, but five days a week. And I will note just for location, Lakeland is about halfway between Tampa and Kissimmee. It's an easy day trip from both. It's also about an hour's distance away from St. Petersburg and from downtown Orlando proper. So it's kind of right in the middle of central Florida. Great. Well, hopefully people will uh, get planning their travel. And uh, again, thank you so much, Jack. And thank you, everyone who was watching online. Um, do want to remind everybody that you can watch the recording of this episode, as well as all of our previous episodes on our website at savewrite.org slash WVV. You'll find the full program archive there. Uh, and then, of course, I want to invite everybody to join us online next month, actually coming up very soon on November 9th, we will be going to Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin. We're excited to see what they are up to there. Um, so I think with that, we will sign off. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.